Arif, what? Did someone call me? Over here, Arif. I can sense that you are in need of SME financing. Is the sound coming from here? How does it know I need SME financing? Am I dreaming? Don't worry, I'm here to help you. Powered by CGC, I'm SME is Malaysia's first SME financing referral platform. No collateral, hassle-free, response within two working days. Go ahead, take out your phone. Hmm, okay. Log on to imsme.com.my and follow these steps. Step 1. Key in financing requirements. Step 2. Share your business details. Step 3. Register or log in. Step 4. Compare and choose. Your application has been submitted successfully. You'll hear from us in the next two working days. No way! Just like that and it's done? Wow, so easy! We're glad that I'm SME could help SMEs like Arif. Everyone's talking about digitalization. Build web store, advertise online, cost, time, so much to do. Don't worry, DG Business makes it stress-free for you. Zero digitalization cost with their connectivity plans. Not to mention free training and technical support. It's so easy. Zero headaches too. Hello. Okay, let me just... Yeah. Okay, I got it. Yeah, I just... Every day so many calls. My customer just love my voice. Hey, just use their virtual office hotline lah. You can take your calls anywhere. DG Business means making business friendly. Not just for you, for your customer also. Hello? Jason, I'm C again. You pass me Sam's later. Why not you use their HR management app? It can help you to manage your staff matters and reduce paperwork too. It's okay. I can go over to check on my sales also. Good time management. The time you spend travelling, you can already set up shop online. Yeah, I know. I can share my offer so much faster using digital advertising. I want to clone myself too, you know. Get DG Business to help. Then you can focus on growing your business. So total will be 26 ringgit and 55 cents. You should get their payment terminal solution too. Grow your business the business-friendly way. Driven by a vision to excel in the digital era, you are redefining the future of your organization. And Digi Business is advancing its industry-leading technology and solutions, built and designed to accelerate your business transformation. Together, let's revolutionize the operational landscape of the oil and gas industry. Transform the ports and logistics services with ultra-connectivity, powering intelligent business operations. Advance the financial sector with next-gen banking services and secured unified communications. Reinvent the way of work for utilities providers, elevating service performance through smart grid infrastructure. As your trusted digital partner, we're committed to your visions. Together, let's create new possibilities and shape the future of the industry today. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome, welcome to Star Media Group and today at the Cybertorium. Just before we start the show later about 9.30 a.m., I will encourage you to put all your mobile devices into silent mode or vibrant mode so that we will not get any disturbance, yeah? Can you do that for me? Yes? Well done. Right, so enjoy the video playback. We will start momentarily, yeah? Thank you.
The career market is full of hope and uncertainty. Whether you're a student in search of an amazing internship or a company looking for an intern to help you grow, an employee who wants to get stronger and reach higher, or a university here to guide your students, we got you. This is Minex by Talent Corp, an all-in-one, easy-to-use platform that brings students, companies, universities, and the workforce together. Minex has many parts. Let's talk about them. My Next Talent helps you understand your strengths and weaknesses via the My Next Profiling Suite, builds up your English skills, explore potential career paths, and helps you land the internship you really want. Here's what it can do. You can get very detailed analysis of your strengths and weaknesses, complete and print out your resumes right on the platform, and get matched automatically to the internship you want. But this platform is not just for students. If you're already in the workforce, Minex can provide the same detailed analysis of your personal and professional traits and allow you to complete your resume right on the Minex dashboard. Minex Company helps employers scout ideal internship candidates right on the platform and connects them instantly. Finally, there is a place in Malaysia where interns and employers can find each other easily. On top of that, companies can even be endorsed with double tax deduction incentives from Talent Corp's National Structured Internship Program, MySIP, all through the MyNext platform. And MyNext University can help university counselors in crafting the ideal plans of intervention for your institution through the MyNext analytical and coaching dashboard that provides institutions with detailed data points of students within the institution based on their MyNext profiling results to help your students grow. MyNext helps you supercharge your professional development. It's like having a whole team behind you for the biggest transition of your life. This is MyNext by Talent Corp. Give us 10 minutes to show you how you can kickstart this amazing journey. We have what it takes to go global. With a diverse range of sectors, Once again, ladies and gentlemen, welcome, welcome, good morning, good morning. Um, may I have the pleasure to invite for those of our visitors who are seated at the back, maybe you want to inch up to the front a bit to fill up the gaps so that um, the latecomers can sit at the back. That would be good. Gentlemen, at the back, if you may, uh, move forward one row, that would be great. Yeah, so that we can fill up the front um, seats first. Could you do that for me, please? Can? Boleh? Nobody's talking to me. Alama. Gentlemen, can I invite you to stand? Yes, that's right. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. We'll match you with buyers worldwide and help you build connections for you to be a global champion. Offering world-class products and services. And once again, just a housekeeping reminder. Mobile phones, iPads, vibrant mode, please. Yeah, you can still use your devices, but please do put on silent mode or vibrant mode. Appreciate that so much. Thank you. Get ready to set the standards and go further. Make a difference. 
because trade matters. The world awaits you. The time to export is now. SMEs coming back. Year on year, the quality of submissions improved vastly. It is clear that our SME are well ahead of the curve and are ready to take their place among public distance companies. Soba Award has been very instrumental in nurturing and growing our SMEs. This is one of the best platforms. Arif, what? Did someone call me? Over here, Arif. I can sense that you are in need of SME financing. Is the sound coming from here? How does it know I need SME financing? Am I dreaming? Don't worry, I'm here to help you. Powered by CGC, I'm SME is Malaysia's first SME financing referral platform. No collateral, hassle-free, response within two working days. Go ahead, take out your phone. Mm. Okay. Log on to imsme.com.my and follow these steps. Step 1. Key in financing requirements. Step 2. Share your business details. Step 3. Register or log in. Step 4. Compare and choose. Your application has been submitted successfully. You'll hear from us in the next two working days. No way! Just like that and it's done? Wow, so easy! We're glad that I'm SME could help SMEs like Arif.
Everyone's talking about digitalization, build web store, advertise online, cost, time, so much to do. Don't worry, DG Business makes it stress free for you. Zero digitalization cost with their connectivity plans. Not to mention free training and technical support. It's so easy. Zero headaches too. Hello. Okay, let me just. Yeah. Okay, I got it. Yeah, I just. Every day, so many calls. My customer just love my voice. Hey, just use their virtual office hotline, lah. You can take your calls anywhere. DG Business means making business friendly, not just for you, for your customer also. Hello, Jason, I'm C again. You pass me Samsung later. Why not you use their HR management app? It can help you to manage your staff matters and reduce paperwork too. It's okay. I can go over to check on my sales also. Good time management. The time you spend traveling, you can already set up shop online. Yeah, I know. I can share my offer so much faster using digital advertising. I want to clone myself too, you know. Get DG Business to help. Then you can focus on growing your business. So total will be twenty six ringgit and fifty five cents. You should get their payment terminal solution too. Grow your business the business friendly way. Driven by a vision to excel in the digital era, you are redefining the future of your organization. And Digi Business is advancing its industry-leading technology and solutions, built and designed to accelerate your business transformation. Together, let's revolutionize the operational landscape of the oil and gas industry. Transform the ports and logistics services with ultra connectivity, powering intelligent business operations. Advance the financial sector with next-gen banking services and secure unified communications. Reinvent the way of work for utilities providers, elevating service performance through smart grid infrastructure. As your trusted digital partner, we're committed to your visions. Together, let's create new possibilities and shape the future of the industry today. opportunities to learn outside the classroom at the SHIP campus. Here at the Opera Theatre, learning is amplified in this great hall that holds over 470 students. Learn in the morning with a lecturer or catch a live performance at night, only at the Opera Theatre. Our three futuristic command centers or computer labs are designed with cool themes such as the Pentagon, Mars Rover and Millennium Falcon 2.0 and are fully equipped with the latest technology to help you gain access to new information and new ideas. The Francis Light Library is home to many informative books and resources that will expand your mind and your world. Choose between a quiet study area or kick back at our comfortable, relaxed study area. Just remember to keep your voice down. Right now, you're probably wondering where this ship has sailed to. Study with your friends in private or hold group discussions at Brighton Beach Boxes. Our theme study areas featuring some of the most iconic locations in the world. Relax and unwind with our amazing facilities. Get your tan on by the beach at our Bondi Beach interactive area. Shoot some pool at the Wembley or sing your heart out at The Voice. Do all this and more aboard the ship campus. Remember, Studying isn't just about books and lectures, it's about spending time with friends and enjoying the best years of our lives. Peninsula Student Residences is our signature student accommodation, mere footsteps away from the campus. Campus life has never been so stylish and chic. Chill out with your friends at our designer student lounges inspired by famed world explorers and exotic locations. Oh, and if you're craving for a snack, head over to the Windjammer Cafe and take a stroll at the Sunset Deck. And the best part? No matter where your academic journey takes you, Peninsula College is your start to a fulfilling campus life and education excellence. 
Located inside an industrial park, you can work part-time while studying with our Jong Pekerja Sambil Belajar program where you can gain real-life work experience and equip yourself to be an employment-ready graduate. Let your dreams set sail at the SHIP Campus Penang's iconic education and lifestyle campus. How can you apply? The career market is full of hope and uncertainty. Whether you're a student in search of an amazing internship or a company looking for an intern to help you grow, an employee who wants to get stronger and reach higher, or a university here to guide your students, we got you. This is MyNex by Talent Corp, an all-in-one, easy-to-use platform that brings students, companies, universities, and the workforce together. MyNex has many parts. Let's talk about them. My Next Talent helps you understand your strengths and weaknesses via the My Next Profiling Suite, builds up your English skills, explore potential career paths, and helps you land the internship you really want. Here's what it can do. You can get very detailed analysis of your strengths and weaknesses, complete and print out your resumes right on the platform, and get matched automatically to the internship you want. But this platform is not just for students. If you're already in the workforce, MyNext can provide the same detailed analysis of your personal and professional traits and allow you to complete your resume right on the MyNext dashboard. MyNext Company helps employers scout ideal internship candidates right on the platform and connects them instantly. Finally, there is a place in Malaysia where interns and employers can find each other easily. On top of that, companies can even be endorsed with double tax deduction incentives from Talent Corp's National Structured Internship Program, MySIP, all through the MyNext platform. And MyNext University can help university counselors in crafting the ideal plans of intervention for your institution through the MyNext analytical and coaching dashboard that provides institutions with detailed data points of students within the institution based on their MyNext profiling results to help your students grow. MyNext helps you supercharge your professional development. It's like having a whole team behind you for the biggest transition of your life. This is MyNext by Talent Corp. Give us 10 minutes to show you how you can kickstart this amazing journey. what it takes to go global. With a diverse range of sectors,
Let Martyrate take you there. Take a step towards being export ready. Get equipped with the information and skills you need. We'll match you with buyers worldwide and help you build connections for you to be a global champion. Offering world-class products and services. Get ready to set the standards and go further. Make a difference, because trade matters. The world awaits you. The time to export is now. After two years difficult time of the pandemic, we start to see a lot of SMEs coming back. Year on year, the quality of submissions improved vastly. It is clear that our SME are well ahead of the curve and are ready to take their place among public distance companies. Soba Award has been very instrumental in nurturing and growing our SMEs. This is one of the best platforms. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and salam sejahtera, tuan tuan dan puan puan. Welcome to our final Soba 2022 Lab and Manara Star Petaling Jaya, brought to you by Star Media Group. My name is Raymond Chia, and I will be your host for today. Soba 2021, we focus on hashtag Save Our SMEs when supporting business survival recovery as the anchor of our Sobra program. Moving forward to SOBA 2022, 
The idea is to optimistically encourage Malaysian business to focus on how to sustain one's business, optimize whatever resources that you had in hand to accelerate their business growth with resilience while thriving into the post-pandemic world. Hence, that's why hashtag S-O-A-R. Ladies and gentlemen, Star Media Group is delighted to welcome Credit Guarantee Corporation Malaysia Berhad, CGC, DG, PKT Logistic Group, Sudan Berhad, and RHB Bearing Berhad as our main sponsors. Talent Corp Malaysia and Ministry of Human Resource as our co-sponsor. A big thank you to official trade promotion partner, Martrade, supporting partner, Brusa Malaysia, and auditor, BDO, strategic partners, and not to forget our official media partner, 988 and Surya Radio Station. Once again, thank you. We and we are very excited to have all our heavyweights here on board with us today. Round of applause for all of you. Thank you. We hope that this great working partnership will continue for many years to come and we are grateful for your expert advice, guidance and support throughout the awards process. Now, ladies and gentlemen, SOBA 2022 recognises the important role of our local businesses towards building our nation and encourages businesses to achieve new milestones and push the boundaries in achieving greater heights. Everyone here has equal chance of winning. All you have to do is find your strength in one or more of the categories and tell us about it. And along with that note, this year's SOBA 2022 LAB Lab stands for Learn, Aspire, Build, in organize various series of webinars addressing valuable business insights. To learn more about SOBA 2022, online application. For those who are on joining us online, you may scan the QR code top right hand of your screen or just visit us at www.soba.com.my. Now, without further ado, let us kickstart the first session today by addressing the topic discussion on Moving Forward 2023, Boosting Economic Resilience. If you have any questions, for our speakers, for the attendees here in Manana Star, Petaling Jaya, we will have a Q&A session at the end of this discussion. For viewers on Facebook and YouTube, you may post the comment section your questions. Lastly, and most importantly, please remember to learn, aspire, and build. Now, before we start, let me introduce our moderator and panelists for this morning. Our moderator, Mr. David Lai, Executive Director, Tax of BDO Malaysia. David has over 30 years of work experience in professional practice that is in audit and tax, investment banking, and in a commercial multinational group. He is currently the Executive Committee and council member of CTIM and chairman of its technical committee in direct tax. Mr. David, round of applause for you. You may take the stage. Thank you, thank you. Now, our first panelist for this morning's session is Mr. Yip Hao Nang, head of SME Banking, RHB Bank, Berhad. Mr. Yip, is the head of SME Banking at RHB Bank Berhad. His main responsibility is to focus on growth of small and medium enterprises. Mr. Yip has moved, I beg your pardon, Mr. Yip has more than a decade of worth experience in various capacities with SME Banking. Mr. Yip, you may take the stage. Our second panelist for this morning's session, Mr. Kwan Eugene, the Chief Marketing Officer of PKT Logistic Group, Sundaram Berhad. Eugene has more than 20 years of work experience in the field of business development, 
logistic operation, fleet maintenance, corporate planning as well. He obtained his Bachelor of Commerce degree from the University of Melbourne, Australia after serving companies such as Park May, Federal Express, Northern Corridor Implementation Authority and DHL. He joined PKT in June 2015 and it's tasked with leading PKT's diversification plan. Wow, Mr. Eugene, you may take the stage. Thank you. And our panelists, the final panelist for this morning session is Mr. Bernard Yap, partner at Ernst & Young Tax Consultants, Jeremy Berhard. Mr. Bernard Yap is Malaysia EY private tax client services leader in Ernst & Young Tax Consultants, Jeremy Berhard. He also leads the financial services tax team in Malaysia. He has over 24 years of experience providing tax advisory and compliance services to conventional as well as Islamic banks, insurance companies, private companies, family businesses, private equity and asset management companies, as well as the high net worth individual. He is a member of the Malaysian Institute of Accountants and the Chartered Tax Institute of Malaysia. And Mr. Bernard, I would like to call you on the stage, thank you. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to start the ball rolling. And before that, I shall pass the microphone to David, our moderator. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Raymond. And um, a very good morning to everyone attending here, both physically and also uh, online. Uh, it, this is something new that we do. Um, nowadays, uh, both online and, and physical, so I have to uh, be aware of the presence of audience from, from both, uh, you know, uh, streams. Um, yeah, very pleased to be able to moderate this uh, first session here this morning because earlier I was a bit uh, uncertain, like a few weeks back, uh, because the our parliament has just been dissolved and uh, uh, we were not sure when the uh, nomination date and elections will be, and so whether the fourth would still be on. But fortunately, it's still on. And, um, and today, for this first session, we are going to talk about moving forward to 2023. Uh, just to explain that this topic has been modified slightly, because originally we were supposed to talk about the budget and how it affects uh, businesses and SMEs. Uh, but because the budget now is on hold uh, until after the elections, uh, it will be retabled again. Uh, and uh, it, it remains to be seen as to whether or not there will be any changes. I think uh, our finance minister, Tunku Zafro, says that there might be some modifications depending on the current status of the economy at the, at the time after the elections. Um, so today, we will not focus so much on the budget. Uh, we will like to talk to uh, the panelists here which from a wide range of different um, industries and we all experience uh, things from different perspectives. So it's good to hear from our panelists here uh, on what they see uh, in 2023 and also coming out of 2022. Uh, of course, remember that um, we're all just still coming out of the pandemic and especially SMEs have been very greatly affected uh, by the lockdowns and also the pandemic. Um, and we were all very much looking forward at the beginning of the year to uh, exiting uh, the lockdown uh, and you know coming back strongly in 2022. And then shortly after the beginning of the year, we found out that this the Ukraine war and because of the Ukraine war, um, you know, all hell bro broke loose in terms of, uh, you know, global uh, uh, activities um, affecting almost everything in the economy from the cost of doing business, uh, you know, um, uh, the currency markets, uh, interest rates, everything has been affected drastically. Um, and, but somehow, Malaysia has survived. Um, 
We are now looking at projected growth. I mean, it was announced in the, in the budget speech, projected growth for 2023. 2022 is supposed to be 7% uh, GDP growth. Um, and looking forward to 2023, uh, the projected growth was announced to be 5.5%. Um, so I think um, 4 to 5%. So I think what the government recognizes is that there might be a slight slowdown. I think this is more because of global events. And uh, we can also see, IMF report said that um, uh, the global growth will taper down to 2.9% from previously 3.2 this year. So even globally, we're all affected. Um, in the budget, we know that the government had plans uh, to increase spending. So there'll be massive um, development expenditure planned. Uh, we do not know whether this will still continue as planned. Um, and it was a record 372 billion. Uh, and development expenditure was up to 95 billion. So this is supposed to uh, obviously try to spur the economy. But there are always, of course, two sides to the coin. Because whenever you spend, uh, the question is how are you going to finance that? Uh, and our debt has gone up quite significantly after the pandemic. Um, our statutory debt limit has gone up to 65%. Uh, it's been moved up, and then our government debt is, is over a trillion. So there will be a lot of pressure on the government to uh, raise finances going forward. And that may be done through the um, uh, medium-term revenue strategy, um, which may involve uh, tinkering with uh, the, the tax system. Um, and there's no clarity yet at the moment as to what will be announced uh, later on how to address that. But we've seen certain things, certain steps that have been uh, you know, thought about, uh, such as um, um, the, the government announcing that they will try to improve the compliance through the uh, tax ident identification number and through the systems, um, and also to look at the global minimum tax as well which is uh, the minimum tax of 15% globally, uh, and how that will be implemented in Malaysia. So that is effectively means that if you have an uh, effective tax rate in Malaysia of below 15%, there might be a top-up tax uh, on, on top of that. So th things like that have, have been hinted. Um, but anyway, before I go any further, uh, I think I will involve uh, the panel speakers here, which are you know, all ready to go. Um, first, I would like to turn to um, uh, Yip Hao Nang, uh, who heads the SME Bank in, uh, in um, SME Banking in RHB. And I think it would be very good to hear from him uh, what he thinks, given the current uh, backdrop, uh, the effect of uh, the current uh, economy on both the banking industry first of all, the banking industry, and then secondly, on the SMEs, which are his customers. Um, we know that uh, there have been uh, four hikes of interest rates already by 25 basis points each time, and, and that will, of course, have a, a big impact on, on, on SMEs. Um, but to the bank, uh, you know, it depends on how they manage the uh, net interest margin, uh, whether they could benefit or whether it's neutral. Um, and also, of course, uh, whether the NPLs would go up next year. But anyway, I'll, I'll leave it to uh, Hao Nang to, to talk about uh, you know, what he sees from his perspective. Yeah. Thank you, David. Um, maybe just allow me to quickly share uh, what is our in-house uh, economist view. Um, there, there will be a slight difference between what we forecast and what, you know, uh, uh, the, the, the Ministry of Finance forecast, or even for Bank Negara for that matter. So first of all, we actually think that this year, our GDP will very, 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 very likely to close at about 6%. Um, in 2022, uh, 2023, um, we think that it will probably end at about 4.5%. So as a direct comparison, you already know that uh, I think that's it's actually a consensus. Um, every you know, uh, uh, every bank or even every institution in the in, in the country actually think that the economy will slow down. 
So that's point number one. Um, point number two is something that actually affects every one of us, uh, the continued pressure on inflation. So we think that for this year, the inflation will most likely end at about 3.4%. So these are our in-house view. But there's a very like, uh, likely chance that this will soften based on the latest statistic uh, that uh, we have conducted. Um, the CPI has actually softened to about 4.5%. And with that, we think in 2023, uh, the inflation will probably slow to about 3%. So while our top line reduced, um, you know, inflation also gets softened a little bit. OPR. So interest rate height is something that affects especially the banker a lot, right? Um, but we have so many interest rate hikes as a banker, I also cannot remember what is the latest rate already. Um, so very, very likely, uh, there will not be any more rate hike after the one that, we uh, that was uh, raised yesterday. Um, this year, we're going to end at about 2.75%. Uh, um, and we do not foresee any more rate uh, after this latest uh, round of hike. Next year, there will still be some rate hike, but we think that most likely it will stop at 3%. That's point number three. Um, if you are going overseas for your holiday, this will probably affect you as well. Uh, ringgit continue to weaken, and where it's going to end. So um, we think that it will probably end and stop at the current, uh, current 4.7 uh, 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 level. Uh, and most likely, it will continue to weaken the first half of 2023, but it will rebound at the end of 2023 and close at about 4.6. So if I were you, I'll probably just save a bit of money this year and probably spend it uh, uh, next year when the uh, ringgit rebound. So I think all in, it's quite obvious that it's not going to be a very uh, good situation right, for 2023. And we have been continued to, to be saying this for the last two, three years. Um, unfortunately, it will be another year where all the SME um, to consolidate and continue to be uh, uh, perseverance. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that that will be my take. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. I think uh, before we uh, dive in more into the uh, uh, SME banking side, uh, I'll, I'll now turn to uh, uh, Eugene uh, on. Uh, the logistics industry, uh, what he observes, uh, and because of course, uh, you know, the, the impact of the pandemic and also the, the, the cost increases on shipping and, you know, the, the due to the Ukraine war as well. Uh, and also our currency uh, has been uh, beaten down. Um, so, uh, Eugene, uh, you want to comment on that? Hello. Yeah, um, I think I have more reason to be optimistic. Um, 2022 has been a year of rebound, especially for uh, in the in the month of May when EPF uh, or, or the government allowed EPF withdrawals. We saw not just revenge spending because um, everyone uh, were allowed to be out and dine and so on, but that extra boost in in uh, disposable income really did help the economy. Um, I think especially f those from the F&B sector, uh, you definitely saw that rebound. You saw everybody coming up in, in strengths to have food outside, wine and dine and so on. Even especially the, uh, the, the, the less spoken economy, clubs and all, they were all open, all reopened. Um, and that effect actually uh, was quite prolonged. Uh, even up till September, we were seeing very strong uh, demand from especially the F&B sector. We were kind of at the front seat. We could witness all this because uh, we support a lot of uh, customers in the F&B sector. And all of them were crying out for, for more capacity. Uh, but uh, the downside of this rebound was there was a lot of shortage of uh, manpower. Um, the F&B sector saw that. We saw that as well. So um, I think moving forward, uh, perhaps we will need the government to really ease this uh, manpower shortage um, by, by means, uh, there, 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 there are many means. I think one of it is the uh, opening up of um, 
foreign manpower. Not something that we encourage or not something that PKT subscribes a lot to, but uh, it is real. Just to deal with this temporary increase in demand for labour, uh, the government should do something, should open it up more so that uh, the, the economies, SMEs like yourselves, are able to enjoy a, a longer period of rebound instead of having to deal with um, capacity shortages and so on. But moving forward 2023, um, I, I would like to share a little bit about uh, how PKT rode through this storm, uh, this pandemic storm. Back in 2008, we, we realised that we had to diversify the markets that we served. PKT used to be uh, very heavily in automotive logistics. So at that time, um, there was a financial crisis, uh, Asian, fi uh, Asian financial crisis in 2008 and we saw our business being hit badly. So my CEO then thought it is imperative that we have to diversify, not just serve one sector, but serve sectors also which will be more resilient during downturns. So he set out to do that. Uh, and uh, just now I was introduced also um, uh, as the person who's in charge of diversifying our, our business. So we went a lot into F&B, into electronics, into FMCG, and that allowed us to ride through this storm this time much more comfortably. In fact, I, if, if I had prepared earlier, I could even show you the charts of how the, logist, uh, the um, automotive revenues for PKT went down right after March 2020, and the, uh, the FMCG and FMB uh, revenue, electronics revenue, uh, in fact, St still continued to climb throughout 2020, throughout 2021, up to 2022. So, um, relating it to the SMEs, um, I'm, I'm sure if, uh, if you can see any opportunities for you to diversify, uh, this would be the best time to do so, so that you can ride through uh, one storm after another, uh, not being too dependent on uh, uh, just a, a very narrow segment where you don't have any wriggle room to, to try to, uh, to compensate when, when you see a certain your, your, long your mainstay segment goes down, you still have other segments to, to we are not talking about growing at the time, but just to tide you through those, those trying periods. Uh. So um, the reason why I have more optimism for 2023, maybe it could be a little bit more narrow because uh, we are seeing the benefits of diversifying. We think that there are segments in the economy which we can still uh, play in to, uh, to, 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 to tide us through. Lah. So yeah. that's, that's... I think uh, that's an excellent tip, uh, <laughs> Eugene, to diversify because it, it's not only for your business, uh, in many other industries as well. We all have to be nimble and be prepared to change uh, our business models uh, because the, the waters are choppy at the moment and uh, don't be stuck in, in one you know, uh, direction and, and, and we, we must be able to modify uh, you know, our, our business plans. Uh, I in the past, it was once a year we do our business plan uh, and then we stick to it. But now, probably every two months or so, we may have to modify our business plan. I think so that, that, that's a very good tip uh, from, from you. Uh, and, and thanks for giving us your outlook on, on, on the industry as well. Um, and I think the point about labor is, is something that affects everybody. I think I can also say from, from uh, the professional services point of view as well, uh, even for us, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's hard to find manpower. Uh, and especially now with the currency uh, being very low compared to our neighbouring countries, um, it, it actually adds the pressure. And then because of that, our costs has, have increased as well. Um, and, and so I'll, I'll pass it on to Bernard, who, who can also tell you a bit more from the professional services point of view. Yeah. Thanks, thanks David. Uh, morning, everyone. So I guess... You know, when we talk about um, today's title about resilience, uh, the opportunity obviously is going to be there. Uh, but I also, I think, echo 
uh, Eugene's view. If you look at the situation where we're in today in this year, 2022, um, it's an opportunity that we come out from COVID and it's actually uh, a chance for us to rebound. And I guess when we looked at the results that were showed in the budget, unfortunately, you know, we have to retable the budget again after the uh, parliament is resumed. Um, I, I think we look at it that this year, I would say about 60 to 75 percent uh, businesses come up and reopen and the business opportunities are there. Uh, I, I also take note in terms of the comments coming out from uh, the outlook for next year because of cost increasing, interest rising in that sense. Um, but we hear a lot about what we need to do. Uh, I guess the opportunity now here is that I still feel that the interest rate today is still low uh, in the sense that if you want to compare it to pre-COVID days, uh, that's the first point. But the second point, I think it's, we talk about the fact that I think the biggest lesson learned from COVID is actually how have we been able to be resilient and adopt ourselves to disruptions. And I think this big lesson here is going to continue for all SMEs, whether you're in the uh, various industries that you're in, including even for us in a professional life, because disruptions is going to continue to appear. Um, we thought we come out from COVID, uh, the chance to opening up our business and everything, we should be able to have a better outlook but the fact that then, you know, the Russian um, war came in, disrupted everything. Um, so what's there to look out for next year? I think it's going to be a full year of business opportunities because the country now going into January will be full in terms of business opportunities. But I think when we speak to a lot of bankers and everything, the other part is that actually all of us are looking towards whether our biggest partner, China, is whether they're going to open up or not. I, I think once that open up, that's going to be a better positive outlook uh, from a global perspective. So we need to think about now, the second part of it is, how do we then deal with if there is opportunities coming out from China opening up? Uh, we hear a lot about uh, it's a current issue and it's going to be there continuously. Um, the shortage of labour, Yes, I, I, I do recognize that. It's a very hard challenge to see whether we want to afford to continue using cheap labor, foreign labor that can come in, or thinking about whether we want to disrupt our own business, bringing in some form of digitalization and automation. Um, I'm not going to say that it's going to be perfect. Uh, even if from a business category perspective, right? we also have the T20, M40, and the B40. Uh, obviously, the T20 has got enough funding and financial strength to do automation and digitalization. But I guess it's the M40 where we are in. All the SMEs are in this. The, the fact that this kind of disruptions is going to continue. How much reliance are we going to do if you are in the industry and in the business where it's on foreign workers? Are you able to be able to be the first one to take the bold move and disrupt your own business to make sure you make the changes ahead? That's, that's the first point. But I guess the second point is today, um, obviously, you know, financial institutions, not only the commercial banks, but the DFIs, they've got also to take care of two things uh, with the interest rate and everything coming up. You know, they look at NPLs, we talk about NPLs, is there going to be a major impact for it? But they also need to look out for newer opportunities, which means that the liquidity in the market is still going to be there because they're going to tighten up in terms from the, you know, the pre old kind of uh, portfolio of loans and they are looking forward to those who are be bold and coming up with changes because this is where they want to promote and support. Given that you are, you are viable and you are vibrant in terms of wanting to change a business model, I think a lot of the DFIs uh, and the commercial banks will be more to support. So that's the second part, I think liquidity is there. And I guess the third part then is, and this is the, going to be the biggest challenge, you may have the infrastructure, you may have the finan financing and funding liquidity for it, but I guess how do we then change our people? Our people is going to have a big, huge uh, acceptance to be able to change towards accepting digitalization automation. I think this is the, the third part is that um, how tolerant and how patient can we be with our people? You've got then various, obviously various age gap in our uh, workforce. Um, the saying is always, how do you teach old dogs new tricks, right? So that's the part uh, is going to be challenging. But to be able to retain the, the new generation, the younger people coming up, they're not going to be very happy to do the same things repetitively, uh, you know, traditionally all over again. So you've got to make sure that you'll be able to learn to mix 
uh, the two school of thoughts in terms of trying to make sure that you move ahead with digitalization automation, but able to sustain it within your own organization to be able to be receptive and accommodate those changes. So I guess you, if you look at it as to the three points I thought, the stakeholders, uh, I guess for the next outlook, the stakeholders will be different. You've got the outsiders who wants to do business with you in terms of a much more efficient and uh, better way. Then you've got the liquidity and financing availability. But I guess I always say the biggest challenge is always internal. You may have the best system and everything, but if they can't change and adopt it, then I guess we're back to square one, which unfortunately then is going to be at a very expensive learning curve because it takes you longer time to be able to adopt and accept the new challenges there. So, so my point is um, I think disruption is going to continue as to how we you know, adapt and uh, embrace that disruption and move forward with new changes. Back to you, David. Uh, thanks, Bernard. I think I think that's good advice, um, you know, a as well. You know, to to really keep up with the times uh, and 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 look at new ways of how to modify, uh, you know, your your workflows and and your people as well. Um, and I, I like the way that Bernard is looking at things more positively, despite the uh, economist's uh, view of next year. Uh, and, uh, you know, the part that has not been, you know, considered yet is the opening up of China uh, and, and how that would uh, hopefully give a boost uh, to, to the businesses here uh, in, in, in Malaysia. Yeah, I think coming back to Hanang, um, we know from the budget uh, uh, that was announced and we do not know whether there will be much modification to that, that the, there was uh, a uh, proposed reduction of corporate tax of 2% for SMEs of up, up to 100,000 uh, ringgit, the first ban, um, and also the proposed 2% reduction for individuals. Um, um, my question is, given the pressures uh, on businesses for next year, uh, do you think that is sufficient and would you hope to see other things uh, in the budget that would help SMEs? Um, and how to address the, the, you know, the possibility of the NPLs going up as well because of the uh, increase in um, you know, uh, interest rates? Uh, how, how do you think uh, you know, uh, that can be managed? Uh, maybe you could comment a bit about that. Yeah. Thanks, David. Um, it, it, it seems like the banker is the only one who feels pessimistic about 2023. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I think, uh, David, you, you got a very uh, good point. So I think the conventional wisdom is that when interest rate go up, my NPL will go up. That's not necessarily the case. So um, I think uh, uh, Bernard was mentioning just now, um, the interest rate environment that we have today, even at 275 this is still lower than pre-COVID era. I, I remember, I think the five years average before COVID is about 3.25, there about. So having the thought that, you know, in the, in, in the increased interest rate environment, definitely my NPL will go up, it's, it's wrong to begin with, right? Um, then I think from a banker standpoint, the second thing that we always consider is, even though if you compare to maybe at the beginning of 2020, uh, until now, even though the, our OPR has already hiked by maybe around one third compared to uh, the 2020 level, how much will this one third translate into increase of installment amount? So maybe just a very quick uh, example. Uh, I was paying you know, about 3000 per month for my housing loan. By the way, I, I bought my house many, many years ago. So <laughs> I was lucky that I don't have to bear the very high the installment. So when I look back at the latest installment, um, the exact amount increase in my installment is actually less than 10%. So what I'm trying to point out here is that even though the rate has hiked by one third, the translation into your cash flow might not be as severe as you think it is. So now, come back to your question. Um, have I seen any you know, increase in our MPL in this environment? The answer is yes. Uh, is it more than what we expected? Then the answer is no. So I think pretty much, at least from the bank standpoint, uh, we do not see that the increase in interest rate will automatically translate into uh, impairment. Yeah. Okay. 
um, yeah, it, it, it's good that you're also not so pessimistic now. <laughs> that, that's good. Um, because uh, I think at the end of the day, there are always two sides to the coin. Uh, I mean, if, if you are um, you know, creative enough, uh, there, there are always new opportunities. Uh, and I think also, uh, you know, for, for, the, for the banking side, um, I'd be interested to know what do you see as the uh, projected uh, loan growth for next year? Because that would also uh, give uh, businesses an idea you know, on, on how optimistic you are and then also how open you are into offering loans to new startups, etc. Yeah. Yeah. yeah um, for, for RHB, uh, we, we were quite consistent in our way uh, uh, in treating SME business. Our priority number one is number one, to, to make sure that everyone survived during the toughest time. And we did exactly that. Um, um, even I think without the, the, the help of uh, uh, Bank Nagara, uh, voluntarily we actually did a lot of uh, uh, internal restructuring for our customer and we make it easy for our borrower to access to our restructuring uh, plan. So that, that was our priority number one and that is also why we managed to control our the, the height in our impairment. Mm -hmm. um, we were also very, very clear for RHB Bank that this is the segment that we want to continue to grow because this is the backbone of our economy. Mm -hmm. uh, and we actually aspire to have double-digit growth again uh, in 2023. Is it going to be challenging? Of course it's going to be challenging, especially with all the economic headwinds, right? Um, but are we ready to do that? Then the answer is yes. Um, I think under the budget uh, that was announced, uh, it was quite clear that MOF has an intention to allocate additional funding to support SME. Mm. The only question is we do not know in what form and shape. Um, and usually uh, when this is announced, it will always come in uh, a, 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 a discounted fund. Mm. For example, what we uh, experienced in 2020 is the SRF, as well as in 2021, to, uh, maybe to a certain part of 2022, uh, our targeted relief funding. So we, we think that Bank Nagara will continue to introduce this kind of fund to support uh, SME in growing their business. Okay. That's uh, more reassuring. Yeah, thank you. Um, Eugene, maybe on, on your side, I think um, because of the manpower pressures, uh, to what extent uh, do you see automation you know, coming in? Uh, and um, would that also require a lot of uh, investment? Uh, and um, you know, what would you like to see in, in, in the coming retabling of the budget that may help you know, in, in that process or in any other things that would you know, help you weather the storm? Yeah. Okay, um, I think uh, just like any sensible management, uh, you have to respond to the time. And the time now is, as I mentioned, is still very much about the acute shortage of labor. So uh, I hope in the retabling of the budget, there are more initiatives, more ideas to, to from the government to solve this uh, acute shortage of labor. And not just uh, turning on the taps and, and, and bringing more manpower to, to the pool, but uh, also as a side effect of this shortage of labor, there's a lot of flux as well you see a lot of um, employers pinching each other's uh, employees. So, for example, like in um, Batu Kawan, our we have a, a, a hub, one, we call it one auto hub in Batu Kawan. And the kind of uh, cannibalization, cannibalization of employees is really mind-boggling. Um, and a lot of them, you know, they just resort to a very selfish way. They just raise the, uh, a lot of the employees just raise the salaries uh, ridiculously just to pinch some people away from whoever they are, they are that, that desperate. So um, I hope the government uh, really has to look at uh, innovative ways to encourage um, more long-term employment, as in, as in encourage employees, especially I would say at the blue collar level, we are seeing a lot of flux at this blue collar level, encourage them to work not just 
uh, for a couple of months and then they feel uncomfortable and then they leave for another job. Um, I, I, um, this, these ideas really need to be uh, tested, but I would think tax incentives can also come into play where uh, if a person has held their job for at least one or two years, then they are entitled to certain tax benefits. Um, uh, like I said, um, I'm not a tax, uh, um, I'm actually sitting in front in, in <laughs> uh, among two, two tax experts here. But things like that, things which are uh, more innovative ways to, to encourage um, loyalty uh, for, for employees. We see a lot of that. A lot of blue collar workers come in, just work for one, two months, they find a job too, uh, too uncomfortable, too hot, too humid, uh, and so on. And then they just leave for the next job, or now there is a, a panacea for them, the gig economy. Go and do Grab, Food Panda, whatever have you. Uh, because just because this job is way too difficult for them, they they rather do something where they are it's flexible as and when they want to do, they can do it. So uh, moving forward, really the for the tabling of the uh, retabling of the budget, we hope the government um, can really you know resolve whatever whatever flux they have themselves, and come up with innovative ways to to encourage uh, loyalty uh, amongst employees. Uh. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Eugene. Um, I'll turn to Bernard uh, on his view of what he thinks um, perhaps was missing in Budget 2023 speech and he hopes that, you know, will, will be in the retabling. Um, I know that both of us actually uh, have worked, um, you know, also on proposals to the MOF on, on you know, tax policy uh, and uh, the elephant in the room is actually GST. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, the, the government has been very quiet on GST in the f past few months. Uh, but they've also said that uh, oh, there's, there's also been a lot of um, talk about GST coming back. Uh, and um, it seems that it's inevitable and it's just a matter of time. Um, but, uh, you know, maybe, um, Bernard, you could let us know your view, not just on GST, but also on, you know, other areas that uh, you think uh, should be there in the budget coming up. Thank you. Yeah, I, for a start, I think, um, you know, the SMEs today in this room and, and on the virtual calls, I think there you got to acknowledge there's a lot of incentives available for each of the respective industries that you're in, uh, whether you need to apply it through MIDA or is actually existingly in our income tax legislation. So I guess, um, do delve yourself into this because the opportunities is there. Uh, second thing I think is when you talk about all these disruptions and things that you want to do, um, there's actually quite a lot of grants available from various uh, ministry. And, and you should check this out because whilst we're having a tax incentive which saves you, uh, you know, 24 cents in a dollar, but if you can get grants replacement for, uh, you know, doing training for automation and things like that, that's a dollar for dollar replacement or, or even subsidy to it. I think that's great uh, on that basis. Uh, I guess the third one is, uh, I've always been very passionate about this, is how do we then get the government uh, to think about where every one of us think about making changes and everything. How does the government be able to support us, whether in the form of making sure we can have the right training for the new expertise that's required, or, or in terms of education that is coming up in the system that will be able to accommodate the new generation coming into employment to be able to facilitate these changes. So, so I think that's the other part, uh, you know, a lot of uh, comments I give in articles and everything is very much focused on the government, I think, still has a role to play, making sure that the infra system in our education must be able to accommodate whatever changes we want to do. So, so that's the part. Um, the, the second bit, I think, uh, in, the, in the budget today, uh, well, sorry, last month, I guess it's very tight. Uh, we all know this is, I, I even lost track of it, the umpteen years that we're in a budget deficit. Uh, it's even worse because it's in the COVID time. I don't think there is enough kind of uh, funding or enough kind of 
treasure, uh, funds in the treasury to be able to accommodate for large infrastructure projects or big uh, government initiatives that will be able to s immediately spur the economy. So, so with that in mind, I think uh, hopefully, this is my personal view, if the elections comes out, we have a, we have a more firm up government with, uh, with the mandate, I think the next five years will be a positive outlook if we have a positive mandate, a complete, uh, you know, full mandate to be able to push it. Because I think a lot of us looking at the budget is one thing, but it doesn't help with the budget being table, right? And then the next Monday we dissolve the parliament. I mean, it gives, it doesn't give a lot of positive credibility to our, to the budget, uh, because we now wait, have to wait until December and see what's the next budget is going to be table or if there's any changes. But I think the more important point is uh, that the, the government coming in has to be able to have that mandate to carry out those initiatives for the next five years. And that's going to be, to me, very important. Um, where does the government then needs to look at to be able to reduce its deficit? Uh, we, would, we, were tracking, we were tracking very well. Uh, David and I were in the, um, the unfortunate three letters GST uh, team with the Ministry of Finance to work into how the implementation and then help to monitor it. Uh, you could see the budget deficit was going down, uh, not only in terms of the quantum, but also the rate. So, so that, that helps. Uh, I'm not saying I'm going to be 100% pro-GST, but uh, the fact that you know, this kind of consumption tax has been successful in more than 100, 110 countries, uh, I think we need to really look at where the weakness were in the old GST system and need to improvise for it. So, so my comments are going to stop there uh, on that basis. But I think the more point is, all of us in this room, you've got a lot of uh, opportunities to able to tap into the incentives, subsidies and grants available in the respective ministry for which you are working in or you're participating in. And I hope that will be a clearer, better uh, view for you that you work on that basis. I, I think when GSC is coming back, in what form, in what rate and everything, I think that's going to be in the in the outlook of a very medium term between the next two to three years. I don't think it'll be immediately coming back. If anything, it'll be announced next year's budget, and then it'll be only be implemented 2025 or 2026 onwards, right? But I guess the point here is we're talking about is resilience. Look at what opportunities you have in the next 12 to 18 months to be able to grow your business moving forward. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, think, I think we've talked a lot uh, about no both from the point of view of um, you know the government, what could the government could do in the coming uh, budget, and also from the point of view of the uh, businesses and more particularly the SMEs uh, going forward into 2023, uh, and and I hope uh, everybody has gotten a good uh, you know insight into uh, these areas from the different perspectives, and I think we've come up to the end of our time, so I will then bring this session to a close. Uh, thank you very much. I'll hand it back to you, Raymond. Yeah. Round of applause to the gentleman on the stage. <laughs> thank you, David, Haonang, Eugene, Bernard, um, for the wonderful sharing on moving forward 2023, boosting economic resilience. And once again, thank you so much, David and panelists, um, for this insightful session, which I'm sure the audience will benefit from. And I will invite you all to take a six back on, on stage. Thank you. Round of applause again, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> and now I would like to call upon um, Ms. Jessie Tan, Head Business Development Manager, Program Lending Model, to be on stage for RHB Bank presentation. Jessie, stage is yours. Round of applause for Jesse. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm Jesse. Um, thanks for your presence to this event. As you're away, we are actually moving into full gear recovery. It's really important for both government and RHB as a banker to assist SME. As what Mr. Nam mentioned just now, we do have SRF during the pandemic 2020. After that, 2021 and up to the first half of 2022, uh, we have targeted relief funding, which is up by the government at a very, very reasonable price at 3.5. But again, I believe it's not all SME able to grab that reason why. Next, please. OK, 
Okay. A lot of SME, they're actually having problem in applications. Why? They think the process is very complex. They need a lot of documents. And it takes the bank too long to approve. If approve is good news, they're also having problems. They don't even know who to approach. And even they get the officer, officer 10 to don't update what is the information, uh, what they still need or whatever. So we actually have uh, online financing. We actually, you can just apply yourself and then next. Sorry. Okay, everybody have smartphone right now. You can just scan the QR code and download the apps. With that, you actually can apply yourself with what you want. And then it's actually very simple. If you don't need, you don't want to update, you don't want to scan the QR code, you just go into esmebanking.rhbgo.com. Next, please. It's very simple application form. It's only take 10 minutes for you to finish. And we do need a lot of documents. It's only the director IC and also bank statement. And then we can finance up to 1 million with five years to seven years, uh, 12 months to 18 months, uh, 10 years. And we just need five days to give you an answer to revert to you through SMS, yes or no. Next. For this one, it's actually interest, interest rate is only up to BLR plus, I mean as low as BLR plus one. And the guarantee fees is actually borne by the bank, by us. Any questions so far? Okay, next. With the recent budget announcement, SJPP actually have come out a nine billion of guarantee. I'm not sure whether that one will be retabled or will continue or not. However, for the bank, as RHB Bank, we actually have this Permulia Governing Guarantee Fund PGGS. Okay, this is open up to all the SME. Whoever annual turnover is 500 million and below, and they have operating more than three years. No matter, and then the most important is 51% is owned by Malaysians. If you have that, you can apply. Because this one is offered a slightly bigger loan size, you might need to contact the RHB banker. My colleague is outside. If you have any questions, if you want to take name card, then walk outside and take from them. Next. Okay, the purpose of this financing, it depends on your natural business. It can be working capitals, it can be capital expenditure, and also you want to restructure all your facility. Just talk to a banker, they will assist. And this is up to 10 years and up to 20 million. Compared to the online one, it's 1 million, this is 20 million. Okay, and then uh, the interest rate can go as low as base plus 0.5%. This is for those um, who do want to just do want to pay the guarantee fee. We do have some. We need some FD upfront. The FD they given to us, we finance you up to five times, and up to ten million, and the interest rate also up to uh, as low as BRR plus zero point five percent. Next, last but not least, this is our corporate credit cards. Our corporate credit cards, you can have unlimited 1% cashback for overseas spending and 0.5% for local spending. And we do have purchasing cards. In case you have any staff that need to purchase, you can just give them a sub card with the limits determined by yourself. That's all from me. Is there anything you want to ask? If not, my colleague will be outside. They can assist you during the break time. Any questions? No? Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Jessie Tan. That was a great sharing um, about RHB Bank. Thank you very much. And ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, we will now kickstart into this next session, which is the next second session. Right. Um, the second session of today, uh, by addressing the topic of discussion on trends transforming the retail industry outlook in 2023. 
First, um, we would like to invite our next moderator of the day, Dr. Mike Lowe, President of ASEAN Retail Chain and Franchise Federation, to come on stage to moderate the discussion. Dato, round of applause for Dato. Mike. <laughs> An artistic talent and demand for Dato Mike Lowe in the hair service industry creates the uniqueness of his services. He is an accomplished stylist who studied in London and Hong Kong and has won numerous awards in hair designs and engaged with local corporate satellite companies under his belt in some other image consultancy and styling for local magazines such as KL Lifestyle, Sisters Pictorial, Glam, I Feel, Icon, Passion, Style Magazines, and many more. <laughs> right. Now, up to the next uh, panelist. Uh, the first one here will be Mr. Liu Kok Wing, Head of Business Innovation and Operations, DG. Welcome on stage. <laughs> now, Kok Wing is a certified public accountant by training with 28 years of working experience planning positions in professional services as a general manager in an Australian listed group and currently in DG Telecommunications. Cock Wing's nine years journey in DG has brought him across various functions in employee services, consumer sales, HR, and currently heading business innovation and operation. Such diverse experience have given him a well-rounded view of businesses as he continues to pursue his passion for business innovation and excellence Round of applause for Mr. Liu. <laughs> and next, we have Datin Katrin Leong Ho Yin, Managing Director of Sense Marketing Malaysia Sinjaran Berhad. Sense Marketing Malaysia Sinjaran Berhad is our SOBA winner 2021. Round of applause for her. <laughs> now, she got the best brand silver winner in 2021, plus a female entrepreneur of the year, meritorious achievement status. Welcome on stage, Miss Catherine. Dato. I mean, I beg your pardon, Datin Catherine. Now, Datin Catherine, the managing director of Sense Marketing Malaysia, Sundaram Berhad, founded the business of Sense and Brand in 2009 with the vision to become number one kitchen appliances brand in Malaysia that leads the trend of functional yet stylish kitchen appliances. Dartin Catherine is the building Dartin Catherine is building a better working world by cultivating talent and providing equal job opportunities regardless of gender and races. She believes everyone shall have a chance to live their life to the fullest working in happy and positive environment with satisfaction and impactful to the community. She always encourages the young generation to share ideas with innovative and innovative strategies. Again, once again, round of applause for that and Catherine for that. <laughs> and our last final finalist, Mr. Liu, Mr. Nelson Liu, CEO and co-founder of Vanilla Mealy Crips Sundaram Berhad. Also a previous Soba winner 2021 in the category of Best Retail Gold and Best Retail Silver. Mr. Nelson, may I invite you on stage? <laughs> Thank you. Now, Nelson, the CEO and co-founder of Vanilla Mealy Crips Christian Sinjaran Berhad, is also the director of Easy Bucks Sinjaran Berhad, has extensive experience in the franchise industry, franchising industry, I beg your pardon. He has received various awards, including consecutive two years of Soba Award winner. In September 2020, he achieved the Malaysia Book of Records for having the largest mealy creep chain in Malaysia as having the most number of outlets nationwide, aside, of, aside from being recognized as 100 most influential young entrepreneur, 
He has also a serial he has also a serial venture builder starting up businesses such as a wax hand craft factory Malaysia, klkdelivery.com and klminigolf.com just to name a few. And without further ado, now let's kick start the session. Tato Mike, over to you. Thank you, MC. Morning, ladies and gentlemen. I think uh, today we have a very uh, experienced panelist and award-winning pan award panelist as well. Uh, the first section, we learned a lot from the uh, first section panelists and the moderators. Uh, our topic's a little bit different, uh, trends transforming yeah, uh, for the retail industry outlooks. Uh, for the past two and a half years, as a retailer, we've been suffering because of uh, 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 pandemics and all of a sudden all the retailers or the consumers were stuck because we don't know what to do and uh, a lot of incidents happened on your family members, your friends or whatever so there's a lot of sad stories, a lot of heartbreaking news, a lot of uh, jobless people so that is unforeseen sets for everyone. I think for the retailers, we're facing huge challenge because um, you, you tune in the pandemic, whatever, so life still goes on. Rent they have to pay, right? And wages have to pay because you have to take care of everyone for a business that you run more than five years and above, right? For myself, I have run my business, Snip Salon for past 30 years so it's a huge challenge all of a sudden you can't do uh, all your business just staying at home right so you have to be very uh, alert and very sober you cannot be panicked because as a head of the company you have to think way out of the pandemics and to lead your company to uh, survive Right. Of course, during the pandemic, some of the companies, some of the production companies, they make tons of money, right? especially in those uh, related materials such as gloves, masks, uh, 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 pharmaceuticals. So they're making billions of dollars. So uh, in a nutshell, meaning that as a retailers, we have to be very diverse. We have to think out of the box how we're going to survive, how we're going to uh, from surviving and yet making during the pandemic, I think is very, very important and very crucial. As Malaysia industry, uh, most of the industry are SMEs, 95% can say. And for uh, online marketplace, we are a bit slow if you compare to like country in ASEAN, uh, country which is like China, they are faster, uh, Thailand which is faster than us, even the Singapore which is faster than us as well, right? So we are not ready, we are not ready for the e-marketplace. So I am also a judge for uh, SOBA, SOBA Award, so I've seen most of the uh, entries, especially the uh, panelists, right? They are the award winner is SOBA, so I read some uh, very interesting business model. They just run the business for past uh, three years and they make a very diverse and uh, uh, a turnaround and create a multi-million dollars revenue right, within a very short period of time. Just, just right on the uh, track, on the put that's bringing them uh, moving forward to another arena. So they are lucky and they have a very far-sighted uh, vision as well. So. But it's not everyone are ready because we are Asian people, right? We are very, sometimes we are uh, quite reserved in terms of diversify our business from a conventional store into an e-marketplace, right? So not many of us are ready, especially though for those friends who are achieved for the past 20 years and above, means the operators might be uh, 45 years and above or 50 over years and above, I can say they are not ready. They use the phone basically just for communication. They are not using the phone for uh, purchasing or doing invoicing or doing accountings. But nowadays, 
uh, we can see most of people using phone for daily uh, works or lives or purchasing. So that is very diverse. That is amazing, right? Last time we still scolding our children, hey, don't touch your phone, don't play your computers. Now you have to train them, become, become a very different person that they can use all sort of gadget in hand, right? And some, some children you can see that they, they are not, they are not uh, uh, very well versed on uh, in their study, but when you give them a new phone, they can turn around the phone within half an hour. That is amazing, right? We used to stop them to doing that, right? But now you have to encourage to do so. Please do it. Uh, son, please do that. That is good, right? Some even though encourage the children to go for uh, what, what you call e-sports. Esports. I have a friend last month just won champion Malaysia in international esports competition, and the parents, the mother is so proud and sending me, sending me the news, this and that. You know, that is crazy. You know, the world has been totally different from what we know. So, are you agree on that? As I think, uh, as a DG uh, telco, one of the leading telco in the country, I think they play a very important role to facilitate, to further push or educate or uh, inculpate, to inculpate the young, the old like us, please move faster, you are, you are slow, right? So I think uh, a lot of retailers, they stuck in the middles because they know nuts about computer, they know nuts about social media, what is KOL, what is KOL? Please tell me what is KOL. I need to pay thousands for KOLs. Last time you pay 300, you're happy, both are happy for KOL. Now, please, 3,000. As a successful KOL, you need to start your price at 3,000, not 300 compared to before. So I think a lot of people is not ready. So how DG can help the markets? Or uh, you might share with us what is your uh, DG plan and what you do for that. Hello. 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 Okay. Thanks, uh, Dr. Mike. Um, good morning, everybody. So um, maybe let me just uh, step back a little bit and just uh, touch on what you actually mentioned. And um, we're talking about retail today, right? Um, MCO and pandemic, um, that was a terrible event. However, um, in the eyes of digitalization, in fact, it ac actually accelerated digitalization in Malaysia and, and most parts of the world. In fact, everywhere in the world, right? Um, so that's, that's very important. Um, when we talk about retail during MCO, the problem was uh, you are not able to engage your customers. Right? You have a shop, it's closed, nobody comes, and you cannot engage. So then, how do you then engage your customers and continue to sell? So, so then we talk about online, right? Uh, go into the online space. We talk about e-commerce. Um, so there's a lot of effort uh, being put in uh, by uh, retailers to try to reach out and, and using online as the platform. Um, therefore, you will see uh, we have seen a lot of uh, um, transactions going into e-commerce. Now, how, how did DG um, uh, work with SMEs and customers? Um, um, there's, there's a lot, because when you talk about um, going online and e-commerce, right, um, just step back, the basic fundamental of online and e-commerce is connectivity. If you're not connected to online or to, to the internet, you don't have to talk about on, you know, anything about e-commerce, right? So I think the, base, the baseline is uh, connectivity. And that's important, having a very stable and fast connectivity um, um, to be able to do your business. And we are not only talking about uh, connectivity in offices and as your store, because today we know you can actually work anywhere, right? So mobile connectivity is key. Um, in fact, we've got mobile natives, right? Uh, uh, businesses all on mobile, uh, not even having a, um, an outlet. 
So that's that's important. And uh, as part of the processes uh, of digitalization, there are also um, encouragement from the government in terms of uh, things like penjana, um, which are digitalization funds. So so this this uh, DG was part of it, and uh, we were able to partner with. Um, uh, social marketing commerce uh, platforms uh, and offer bundles together uh, and subsidize that with the Pinjana uh, grant. So for the SMEs, it was quite simple because you don't need to go and knock on doors uh, at, uh, at Bank Bumi Putra uh, or BSN, sorry, at BSN uh, to apply for all these uh, Pinjana uh, funds. But it's just a one-stop center. You just come to Digi and we actually bundle the connectivity plus the productivity or marketing uh, platforms that will enable you to actually get onto the uh, e-commerce or, or online space. So, yeah. Uh, I think it's good that uh, your, your company can offer a lot of services. I think moving forwards, a, the e-commerce platform is not only uh, to provide the services. So how you foresee that uh, the sustainability on e-commerce? Because um, now we, are, we already get, get the report saying that uh, during the pandemic, uh, the number have increased in terms of uh, e-commerce uh, purchase or whatever so. But just right after the uh, MCO have been released, and we also get the report saying that the e-commerce has been declined immediately. So how, how you will uh, encourage and share on this um, e-marketplace? Um, very good point, actually. Um, yes, it's true. Um, you can see that quite uh, evident, right? Um, during pandemic, uh, everybody started buying stuff from uh, e-commerce, right? And then we order food, grab or, or whatever. Then when things start to open up, everybody wants to go out and eat, right? It's, uh, I think in the previous panel, uh, someone mentioned uh, um, that this, this is the same phenomenon, right? Not just in terms of retail, but also in businesses. Um, so what is, what is important is uh, maybe, maybe I will, sh let me just share some stats, right? Um, in 2021, um, there was a study, right? Um, worldwide, in terms of retail, uh, online retail, was about 19% um, over the total retail in, in the world, right? And that's about 5 trillion USD. Then what do we foresee in 2026, um, right? Uh, so fast forward 2026, um, we're still looking at growing um, the e-commerce um, for retail. Retail e-commerce is expected to be only around 24%, but that is 7 trillion USD. So, so there's still a lot to, to go, right? Um, so two points. One is brick and mortar retail is not going to die. Not anytime soon. Okay, that's important. Um, still going to represent around 75% of total retail. But two is Yes, in terms of uh, using online and e-commerce, but transactions is on, on, online is not just about transactions. It's also about engagement. You're using online space, not just for the transaction per se, but actually for other purposes. So you have to think about online is not just about putting yourself on Shopee or Lazada and that's it, thank you very much. It's also about understanding your customers and how the shopper's journey is about and taking the advantages of being online, the reach, and also if you have a retail, bring that back to your uh, physical retail as well. So you got to rethink your physical as well as your, your online space. Thank you, Gawing. Uh, Dating Catherine, I would like to know more about your share on how you a, your experience and your thoughts on the social media platform from the conventional business and turn it into the social medias? Uh, first of all, uh, good morning everyone. So um, uh, just like what Tato Mike have uh, said earlier in the opening speech, 
my business was actually badly affected by MCO2 because uh, we also dealing with dealers where our dealers is actually retail shop. Most of them are retail shop. So we actually can't do business during MCO period of time. So what, can, what we can do during that period of time was to do a lot of uh, promotion and also advertise on social media platform. But from what my observation is, um, now the market has been segregated into very, very niche sectors, which uh, like a social media platform, there are so many different social media platforms available nowadays. For example, like for Facebook, we can see the audience is much more on the 70s to the 90s. And for IG, now mostly is on the 90s and even those that are born 2000. And we can see now the latest one will be like TikTok. We can see those uh, audience in TikToks will be very young born after 2000, and we see a large Malay population in it as compared to Chinese. This is what I observe. And young Chinese now, uh, they are moving to Xiaohongshu and also uh, TikTok, Douyin. And there is a new <laughs> latest uh, Malay platform coming, which is like Xiaohongshu, which is called Lemon 8. So I think it's very challenging for us SME. How do we catch up with so many different social media platforms? And which social media platform should we focus on? Because we don't have so many resources to target for all different kinds of audience. So for me, I think brand positioning is very important. You have to know what your brand is, what products you are trying to sell, and which target audience is your main one. Because you cannot target everyone. Your products is not sell for everybody. So you really have to think which pro which target or which social media platform I want to go into. So uh, having said that, uh, we have to change a lot, <laughs> adapt to the changes a lot. So like what I said, now we are talking about TikTok. Maybe tomorrow there is a new kind of social media platform coming up. Then our team have to move very fast. And we actually have to uh, give advice to our dealers because we are the wholesaler. So we really have to give them the direction what uh, our promotion and what our campaign is for the futures. So our dealers will know, okay, uh, Sense is selling certain products that are targeted to certain social media platform. So we have to really change a lot. So um, this is what my opinion is. I think it's amazing because uh, uh, Sense appliances is ready for the new market you can say that because you know almost every social media platform that's not everyone uh, here are knowing that uh, it's not easy to diverse from a conventional distribution network turn into social media as one of your window right so i think it's amazing we're going to understand more on you later so nelson um, you are one of the um, niche FMP outlets that you have, you know, you're selling something very different from others uh, FMP shop, and how you overcome yourself uh, to convert to diverge from the conventional store uh, FMP outlets into a new market such as marketplace, e-marketplace. It was it was it was actually very challenging for us because uh, uh, the the last five years. We, you know, we learned the, the thing about location, location, location. So what we what we did for Vanilla Creek was uh, we we identified all the great A locations in the perfect shopping mall, uh, like in Pavilion, Mid Valley, and all that. But when the pandemic happens, it, it really um, uh, forces us to pivot online, and uh, we learned everything from scratch. So what we did is we we definitely learned from the surrounding. We learned from our uh, friends uh, who are in the retail. Fortunately, we, we joined a lot of trade associations like ERFF, MRCA, and so we, we, we get a lot of uh, uh, mentors and seafoods that came to us to, to really teach us on how we can immediately you know, pivot it online and uh, you know, um, go digital all the way. Thank you, Nelson. And everyone knows that uh, Malaysia is a small country. We have only 33 million population, right? If you compare to Philippines, Thailand, or a China, yeah, we are small. But definitely when we compare to Brunei and Singapore, yes, we are big. We are bigger than them. So how, Catherine, nothing Catherine, how you uh, foresee, because uh, we are right middle in the central of ASEAN country, so uh, in uh, end of uh, end of February, uh, the RCEP has been enforced for the 10 plus 5 country in ASEAN country. You are talking about 30% 30, 30 of the world population is focused on these 15 countries, right? And you're talking about 30% 30 per, 30 of the world GDP are, are from these 15 countries as well. So how are you going to capitalize these 
digital platform, the transformation of digitals in retailing uh, in order to capture a much bigger uh, market instead of only Malaysia. I think the uh, amazing of uh, e-commerce is we got to we got a chance to trade all over the world because we can sell our products to uh, different different countries. But I think for me, most important we have to understand uh, from the consumer point of view, like what are the problems consumer face when they purchase products online in order for our e-commerce sales to grow further. For example, for us, we the feedback that we gather from our dealers is a lot of time when they sell their products online. Uh, customer, the, the products that they sell is very easily to get damaged during transportation by courier company. And most of the time when customer launch a complaint and for our dealers to get compensation from a uh, transport company or for the online platform, it's actually uh, almost impossible to get any compensation. So most of the time our dealer have to offer a free products to ch exchange to customer because we don't want customer to have a long waiting period of time just to get the refund or to get a new products. So for us, we understand that the dilemma our uh, dealers are facing. So we actually have a, a plan for our dealers, whereby if our, if our dealers sell their car products online and they launch a complaint to us saying that the products were damaged during transportation, we will offer a one-to-one -one exchange to our dealers immediately. So they don't have to wait for uh, investigation purpose on how come this will happen and the customer can get a new products also immediately. So I think this is, uh, this is the one of the way very important for you to understand the problem customer face, then you can tackle the problems. So because e-commerce, a lot of people are doing business online, but how can you stand out from so many different brands and so many different products? So for example, if you search for range hood or cooker hood or electric hookers, maybe more than 20, 30 companies came up. So you have to stand out. Uh, one of them, I think, is the after sales service. So what I'm talking about is you, if you understand like the problem your consumer face doing uh, uh, business online, then you can tackle the problems. Yeah, this is what I think. I think this is good. So if you want more product security, then you have to look for uh, Dutton Catherine for her, for her brands, right? So how about Nelson? Uh, how are you going to share with us, with the audience, uh, uh, the topic for direct to customers? Because all the while that uh, as the operators, retail operators, we set up a shop, make it beautiful and choose the right location, waiting for the consumer to look for you, right? That is conventional way of doing business. You just wait, right? So how are you going to do that to diverse uh, from instead of waiting customer to look for you, how you deliver direct to consumer? For <coughs> uh, that, that, that's actually a very good question. Uh, so for Vanilla Creek, we have actually adopted a number of models. Uh, for example, like the Omni Channel, uh, and even the the Bo Piece model, uh, buy online and purchase in store, uh, and also a lot of targeted marketing, uh, especially using uh, Facebook ads. We 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 do a lot of um, uh, targeted uh, based on the the selected target and our uh, campaign. Uh, we we actually have uh, hired a number of uh, uh, outsourced agencies to, to do that because they are the expert ones. Uh. As what we realize, um, you see, digital experience is very, very important over digital channels. So uh, you may have a lot of digital channels, but the total experience that you, uh, from the moment you want to click in to purchase uh, a creep cake, um, you know, to the end where you receive it and you enjoy it, it is, uh, you know, where we curate from A to Z to, to ensure that it's a very smooth journey and you you will have a repeat purchase. Thank you, Nelson. Coming back to Godwin, I think uh, we have shared on the uh, Dr. Catherine and Nelson on the delivery and the uh, the concept of doing e-market uh, business, right? So, how what is the share that uh, to the to the audience? Because when you heard on what we uh, what they share is uh, they have very diverse on the company approach, especially on marketing, especially on the deliveries. So that will be increasing on the operation costs, right? So what is your share on uh, uh, with the audience in terms of uh, the additional costs? What, the, what, is, what, is, what is the difference and what is the ultimate? Yeah. Yeah. So... Um I like the points that uh, was presented just now, and um, I'll touch on some of them, right? Uh, also in relation to cost. Um, when we look at digitalizing or going online, I think uh, one of the things that we always advocate SMEs is 
don't jump in and throw everything in. You have to take it step by step because it's a bit of a journey, it's a learning process. So, so that's one, you have to be a bit prudent, but you must be willing to try and, and go and do it. Um, so that's one. Two is, um, in terms of um, business models today, right, um, it's very different from years ago. Years ago, you want to get the software, you have to buy the software, you have to install the software, and you have to spend a lot of capex. You take a lot out upfront and you try to invest, right? But today, the models are very different. Today's models are mainly subscription models. So you can take baby steps, you can, you can subscribe, try, if you like it, subscribe more or expand and do more. If it doesn't work for you, move on, try something else, subscribe something else. So, so I think today's model is very conducive for digitalization, for, for companies or SMEs to try to move to a new space. Um, and the point from Nelson, which I really like, is um, he has looked at omni-channel. I think omni-channel is very important. Um, the customer journey, the sh we call it the shopper's journey instead of the user's uh, needs, right? So shopper's journey is, a, is really about um, the consumer, how they, before they even buy your product, how, how their journey uh, begins, where are the touch points they go to, when do they consider uh, to think about your brand and your product, and then ultimately sign up or buy. Even sign up and buy could be online or it could be offline. So it is very important to understand your, your customers first. So, so then in summary, I'd say you must want to actually change, but the changes need not be full swing all at a go. Take baby steps and different SMEs have different uh, stages. They are on different stages and they do different things. Um, and just one last point, um, uh, Datin Catherine, right? Uh, which which makes sense. You today you have so many platforms, you have so many social medias, right? And everybody is doing some crazy thing, and it works. You know that you see a lot of that. But for SMEs, I think it's important that you understand your customers, you understand your brand, your niche, and you use um, those platforms that make sense for you. And don't try to chase technology so much, but understanding what works for you and continue to grow in that space. Thank you, Godwin. I think uh, it's a good share from, from all the panelists. And uh, to remind the audience, I think we are talking about the diversity from the conventional business into a digitalization platform. So it's a must for a change because uh, we are talking about borderless, at, uh, borderless business, borderless trades, how you direct uh, deliver to your consumer and how you have a new thoughts on the marketing platform rather than the conventional that you has been practiced for the past 10 years, 20 years or maybe 30 years. So it's a need that we have to moving forward to transform our business right, in order we can communicate well with our children because they are young. So we have to have the same channel to communicate. And uh, an important thing is about Borderless. borderless is important because we cannot only foresee looking on the 33 million population markets, we should have a, con a diversity on digitalization, looking for a much bigger, wider uh, consumer base rather than uh, only from Malaysia and beyond. I think this is important. Right? And uh, uh, thank you so much for uh, Godwin on the share on the uh, digitalization and Dutton Catherine and Nelson for uh, uh, a wonderful sharing from the conventional and to e-marketplace, right? So anything to highlight before we end the uh, sections? Godwin, Catherine? Maybe, maybe i just just add one more thing. I think while we are all excited about digitalization, going online, being mobile and even mobile native, right? I think one thing that not many people think about is actually cybersecurity. I think that's a very important thing that we should not forget. Um, as we use our mobile and everything going onto internet, right? Cybersecurity is paramount, in fact, right? And just to stand one last stats, right? In, in Southeast Asia, Malaysia is in the top two in terms of the most phishing malware, ransomware attacks 
in Southeast Asia. So just bear that in mind when you go into online, make sure your internal systems, you have security in terms of cyber security, even on your mobile phone, because we all do business on mobile phones today. Yeah. Yeah, I think cy cyber security is one of the important issue for us. But uh, you cannot say that you've been, uh, uh, you were, you were one of the victims for the uh, uh, the, uh, the con case from online con case, then stop you for moving forwards for uh, any further development for e marketplace. So I think you just be aware, and you have to be more uh, 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 clever than them. Because Malaysia are very tal Malaysian are talented. So we are champion for everything, you know. So we have to be uh, much, uh, much aware and much smarter, right? So, uh, uh, I think Catherine, any to close? Yeah, I think my last highlight will be uh, when managing social media platform. The most important uh, things we have to remember is uh, persistent. You don't expect to see result in a short period of time. It take years, maybe like five, six years, even like ten years. So for us, for when we first started our TikToks, a lot of our competitors are very confusing. Why are you moving into such a young generation? Are they your key target audience? Are they going to buy from you? Of course, it's not going to buy from us anytime soon. But we are cultivating them and let them know what our brand represent is. And we also put a lot of efforts in making a lot of short videos because we see the trend. So for TikTok, uh, we have been doing it now for one and a half years, and we can still we can see a slight result. But we still have to keep on continue in uh, managing it because we believe younger generation younger generation when they are uh, looking for new products, these are these are the definitely the platform they are looking at so have to be persistent yeah yeah it's true i think catherine is very true you have to spend at least uh three years five years or maybe more than that right don't give up and don't say that hey i have tried that and never uh, i didn't see result and you stop it you know so somehow you have to start uh, doing it no matter you get the result or you're not getting the result that is important because we spend uh, many years on a the e platform, right? So uh, Nelson, any share the last share or tips to the audience? Yes, definitely. Uh, I think the last one will be uh, the game has changed. Uh, any old rules in the game um, is already irrelevant to the next norm. So I think I, I think it's right now um, the best time to reskill our employees and to reskill ourselves and to really be adaptive, uh, learn from you know the next generation. And uh, just be open, join more association, and you know, just keep networking, and uh, yeah. I think what Nelson share is true. Uh, as ARFF, ARFF is ASEAN Retail Franchise, and for the past two weeks, in fact, today our delegates still in Vietnam for study tour, yeah, trade mission and study tour. Last week we were in Thailand, Bangkok for study tour, and we learned a lot from the markets, from the behavior, market behavior, spec, consumer behavior, and how the op the the sh uh, shopping mall operator run in a creative way of doing business. I think. Uh, for us, we have to, for moving forwards, we have to see more, not only from Malaysia as per se, we should uh, see more beyond Malaysia because you are doing business uh, a, on e-market platform that is talking about global business. A, one day you might see uh, uh, Catherine, that thing Catherine products is used in Hong Kong, right? Or maybe in UK or whatever so because she did so well in the social media platform that impressed the buyer consumer from other country. So I think that is not a full stop for our business as a retailer or SME or whatever so, but we have to move on to create uh, 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 in a creative way, uh, the digitalization way, yeah. Thank you, Raymond. Thank you, Dr. Mike. Now, round of applause for them. And the moment that we've been waiting for, I can see some faces here who would like to pop a few questions. So I would like to open to the audience. Do you have any questions for panelists today? Um, you can approach the mic or my colleague um, will come to you. Anybody? We have one gentleman over here. Maybe I come to you. Yes, good morning to the distinguished panelists. My name is Joseph. I wish to post this question with regard to this uh, transactions online. Is it more towards uh, consumer-related products like food, 
which there is a demand for online transactions or is it for physical assets? Thank you. I think Nelson, you can answer that. You're talking about food. Could you repeat your question again? Eh? There's a demand for online transactions, of course, uh, going digital and, uh, and so forth. And is it the demand for consumer-related items like food, uh, food delivery to the homes? Uh, or is it for physical assets? You know, physical assets, there's bound to be some some f flaws while in while trans uh, trans in the process of uh, transferring the goods to the consumer. You see, maybe there can be damage or defects. But I believe when it comes to food delivery, it's not an issue. So which one there's a demand for? Is it in consumer related like food or is it physical assets? Thank you. Good question. I think based on our experience, uh, the demand for uh, digital payments online are definitely uh, growing. And uh, you know, with, with the new norm, uh, a lot of people experiencing uh, uh, total change, especially in the managing your, your cash. Uh, especially when every one of us already have an e-wallet, it makes a lot of sense to, to make purchases online and uh, as simple as a single click. Yeah. Thank you, Nelson. Anybody? Anybody else? Yes, we have one gentleman at the back. Good morning. Um, I have a question for Mr. Liu. Uh, we've read the reports. I think the five of the telcos have signed with DNB already uh, on the launch of the 5G services, including DG. Uh, so my question is, with the launch of 5G, presumably maybe by next year, 2023, how will that uh, be able to benefit uh, the retail industry uh, with 5G available? Thank you. Okay. Um Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, yes, uh, 5G will be launched pretty soon, uh, as you have mentioned. Um, um, it has been signed. Um, I think we all have to understand that um, we have to take 5G um, uh, in a step-by-step -step approach. I think uh, the 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 first thing that will come through via 5G would be um, immediate connectivity to your 5G phone. Right, uh, those of you who already have 5G phones, the iPhones and uh, the newer or uh, models, um, you would be able to to actually see 5G connectivity and uh, and the advantage of 5G actually um, there are, there are few um, very very clearly of course in terms of speed. However, um, the other thing which is more important is actually latency. So um, the improved latency actually has a lot more advantages uh, in terms of uh, businesses and SMEs. Um, SMEs, not just about retail, SMEs also uh, about manufacturing and logistics and, and things like that. There's a lot of um, technology out there that requires um, uh, low latency um, connectivity. And that will allow you in terms of um, perhaps um, automation. Um, there is no latency means uh, the lag, right, uh, between um, that the equipment um, moving this way and the system actually knowing that it's moving this way at the millisecond. So there are a lot of advantages that SMEs can uh, actually uh, see with 5G. However, is not going to be you know you know immediately. Um, it's it's more about building the IoT cases, case by case, and building that as, as uh, businesses go along, as well as as connectivity and 5G is switched on at different places. So don't, don't, um, don't think that 5G, when say you launch 5G, means the whole of Malaysia will get 5G. Uh, that's not the case. Um, it is how DNB is going to roll out, where they'll roll out, uh, where the priority areas, what kind of businesses will start to look at uh, the advantages of 5G and start thinking about, you know, what are those things that will uh, be able to use the low latency and high bandwidth, yeah. yeah. Thank you, Kowei. One more, if you, all right, lady, please. Hi, good morning, my name is Sarah. 
Um, my question is more directed to uh, most retailers. Um, we all know that there are actually millions of uh, retail space in the market right now in Malaysia. So um, being retailers, how do you actually see in terms of this brick and mortar retail spaces that's so excessive? And uh, how are you going to um, choose as to which are the ones that you will actually go into? That's question one. Uh, question two, what is your view on transit retail or retail transit? That is basically, if you see, um, we're talking about a lot of um, shopping malls, but what is your view on transit retail as in like uh, retailers that are in the LRT stations or the MRT stations? Thank you. Uh, I think the quest, uh, I can answer the first question. They are, as you say, yeah, true, it's millions of uh, uh, square feet uh, retail outlets in Malaysia at the moment, and we can see that it's oversupply in terms of uh, uh, the markets. So uh, in when you choose your retail outlets, definitely you have to choose for those consumer that is related to your business in the territory that relate to your business based on the uh, spending behavior, uh, the uh, 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 consumer characters that you have to choose as first point. The second point is whether the, the outlets, the price of the render, the, uh, the price of the render, whether it's within your budget. Yeah. So the third one, the location, whether the transportation is good enough for you, whether because in Malaysia, in KL especially, it's all rely on parking, whether you choose the right parking place, you know, for your consumer, your customers. So that is determines on, on that. that. But coming to your questions, as now, uh, as we discussed just now, the population for Malaysia or in KL markets, we are not uh, sufficient on the supply and demands. So we are rely on a tourism market. As I have a I have a business in Thailand. Uh, for the past few months, we can see the tremendous turnover from the con uh, tourism market in Thailand. Right. So you are talking about millions of people going into Thailand market, especially Bangkok. So you can see. The whole retail market is very vibrant, so I think uh, the government have to look into the tourism markets in terms of a, a only the uh, foreign investment because tourism market is one of the instant cash that you can turn around for all the retailers because you don't need to develop anything in order to capture them because we already have su sufficient shopping malls, retail outlets or whatever. So, so, we, so we need tourism market, uh, we need uh, uh, foreign investments as well to come in. That will be justified on supply, demand on the uh, properties. So that is the first uh, answer. So maybe uh, the second one, I. Uh, share with the panelists? Um, for me, I think just like what Dr. Mike said, uh, in which retails, uh, which shopping mall or physical store that we go to, of course it depends on the products that we are selling. But I can see a trend like, for example, for for us, for me, uh, my products is not FMCG, it's not a fast mov moving product. So uh, for that trend, I would say if I choose to have a physical store, I might not choose at the shopping mall. I might have our own HQ, which I will look for a bigger space, maybe like 5,000, 10,000. I will make it as the, maybe like the largest showroom for maybe kitchen industry in a certain state, one state once. So for customer to have, uh, they will travel all the way through your showroom because they, they, they will foresee that there is a large range of kitchen appliances that where get, they can choose from. Because in shopping mall, most of the time, the space is very limited. And even if you can rent a bigger space, it will be very expensive. So for cost effective, I think is uh, quite a burden for SME and also you need to manage uh, people's like the indoor sales, your salesperson in a different location. So how can you manage with that? That is very important. So I, I will see for, uh, for us, for this kind of uh, home products, you can actually uh, consider to have your showroom not in shopping mall. 
but in other industry area where you can have a bigger space, so you can display more products full range. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, panelists. Well, huge thank you to Dr. Mike, um, Mr. Liu, Dr. Catherine, and Nelson for such a great and meaningful discussion a moment ago. Round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> and uh, I would like to invite Dr. Mike, Dr. Uh, Dr. Catherine, um, and as well Mr. Nelson to come off stage. And Mr. Liu Kokwing, you may remain on stage for your next presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, the panelists, round of applause for them. Okay, it's me again. Hello. Okay. Um, thank, thank you, everybody. Um, it's, it's me again, and um, I will just go through very quickly a bit about uh, DG Business and what we offer to SMEs. Okay. Um, very important, um, we are very business friendly uh, and digital matters to us. Uh, I think that's, that's the main uh, key thing, right? And we want you to grow. We want you to grow in terms of your revenues, in terms of your pr productivity. So that's important. So next one. So when we look at um, the market landscape, right, uh, especially for SMEs, a um, couple of things in terms of digitalization. Uh, as I mentioned, you know, um, where do you start, right? Um, in terms of digitalization, um, do I throw a lot of money into it? Uh, I don't have enough money, I don't have enough capital, I can't invest, right? So why, why do you get me on, uh, online? I will just stay as a retail or I'll stay as an SMB and, and do what I've been doing for the last 10 years. Um, I don't know about uh, digitalization, I don't know about internet, uh, don't ask me to change, I don't know what tools, um, I don't know what is KOL, okay? so. We've identified four things, right? Four key uh, uh, areas um, that you need to consider if you want to do digitalization, right? And uh, we, th we believe it is important. One is in terms of your marketing. Two, uh, in fact, we feel it's, it's HR. Uh, why? Because uh, digitalization, when you want to shout digitalization to the rest of the world, right? But your staff is still filling up forms, right? Still, you know, tons of paper, a boss can sign up. So you're not driving the kind of culture, right? You need to drive the same culture. You want to digitalize, you need to go all the way inside out, okay? Third is e-commerce. We've been talking about e-commerce quite a fair bit. And also, um, from MCO, we all know we all can uh, work remotely, you know, uh, especially those who are not on uh, with the brick and mortar retail uh, businesses, you can work uh, remotely. So these are four key areas we've considered. Uh, next. So these are kind of reasons why you want to digitalize, right? Um, you want to maximize your reach. Um, you want to be able to not just sell at your location, you want to be able to sell worldwide if possible, right? The world is your oyster. Um, the second point is uh, going back to uh, digitalizing for your employees. Uh, you improve your processes, you simplify your processes, that's important, right? Um, you want that culture to be within your company so that you can bring that same culture out. Um, of course, with DG, we believe in bringing value. We believe in bringing value to SMEs, to our business customers. Um, and you also want to evolve and continue to change because your customers' needs change, your customers' journeys change, and the demand is very different. And if you just stay the same, you will not go anywhere, you will actually uh, fail, right? So that's very important. That's why everybody's thinking about digitalization. Um, let's move. Next one. So then why, why us? Why DigiBusiness? Um, as I mentioned, in terms of uh, business models today, it's very different. It's no longer, you know, you need to spend a lot of money up front, throw a lot of money, and then you, you, you invest, and then you say, oh, darn, mistake. Uh, spend a million bucks in there, and I failed. Today is very different, and theref therefore, DJ business is also uh, very different because uh, it's very low upfront fees, right? Uh, we, we talk about um, guidance from our account managers. Because it's SME, this is not consumer. Um, we actually guide you. We have account managers to, to hold your hand um, to make sure that, you know, where there's a need, we will work with you. We'll find the partners and we'll actually uh, handhold you, right? 
And of course, uh, we believe we have the best customer experience. Uh, that, that's something that uh, is very much in our, in our yellow heart. Okay, Max? So this is a bit about our baseline. Our baseline is connectivity. I think the most important thing is connectivity. Without connectivity, as I mentioned, you get nothing, right? You can't go online, you can't go onto the internet, what can you do, right? So connectivity and value is very important for us. Um, everybody knows, you know, DG is a telco. We have postpaid lines, um, free internet uh, or free ID calls, uh, free calls, uh, SMSs as you need. Um, it's it's all there. And I I did mention a bit about security. I believe security is truly very important, especially for SMEs, because it's like you know there's there's a study saying you know 60% of those SMEs that got um, security breach, right, actually fail. Ultimately, they fail, right? It is very devastating, right? So, so actually, our, our business uh, plans actually come with a uh, mobile security at three ringgit. Actually, it's super cheap. And this is not just, it's not an antivirus. Huh? It's not antivirus. It is actually DNS level. That means it filters out not on your phone. It's actually at the network. Okay, so this is very different. It's, it's not like you know you download a bit defender kind of thing. It's different. So then of course if you have a business outlet, you have a office, you need to have Wi-Fi, you need to have fiber. We all offer that. Uh, and, uh, and in terms of our network, in fact, uh, we we are the fastest network. We are the most consistent network. Not just for one year, not two years, but three years. This is third year running. Okay, so that's uh, a bit of a fact for you. Next. Anyway, you talk about different solutions, right? And these are just some of the solutions, not all the solutions, because depending on where you're at uh, in your journey to digitalization, um, there are different things, uh, different products or different solutions that would be suitable, right? So this is kind of like a baseline. If you talk about marketing bundle, we talk about Alvana. Uh, this is a partner that we work with. This is an omni-channel uh, or multi-channel or omni-channel. Um, where you can not just have your web page, um, you can also um, sell into Facebook, Instagram, and things like that. So it's, it's, it's all in one, and this partner is really uh, good because they handhold you all the way, depending on your needs, right? Um, SMS, people say, hey, we don't do SMS anymore. In fact, SMS is still a big business, okay? SMS is still a big business. So if you need to have SMS, no worries, we have SMS. Of course, on the productivity bundle, um, we, we have an om uh, this product called Omni. If you, if you remember, or uh, if you know in the olden days, right, um, <coughs> this thing called PABX. You know, um, receptionist, and then it will plug you to, to the next person or to the next person and transfer you, right? This is virtual, <coughs> virtual PABX. So basically, you have a virtual receptionist that will call a landline number, right? And then that landline number will actually transfer to your handphone. Okay, so you don't need to be in your office to take landline number uh, calls. So you can be anywhere. So it gives you full mobility. It's all virtual, right? No setup. You just subscribe and then set it up, and it's done. Simple. And then <coughs> the last one is all HR. As I say, we believe in digitalizing for your employees. All HR is a a product for your employees. <coughs> how you engage with your employees, all right? Let's just move on. And this is probably my last slide. Um, so in summary, there, there are three things, right? Number one is um, get onto the journey, go digital, um, digitalize, try. Um, you, you will be amazed. There's a lot of opportunities out there, right? Because the, the, the world is your oyster now. It's no, no longer your, your retail shop, no longer just Malaysia, right? Two is, <coughs> we provide you a one-stop. So I've got colleagues out there. We've got the uh, B2B team that will work with you. Um, so reach out to us. Um, we will provide you the service, um, no matter where you are at in terms of your journey to digitalize. And uh, because we can, we bundle, well, we bundle savings, right? Not just the traditional connectivity, but we also bundle with the solutions so that you not only get the connectivity, 
but you also get the solutions at a very good value price, right? And this is um, one more last slide just to end this. Yeah, so if you do need to connect with us, very simple, it's either our webpage, you can call if you want, you can email to us, or if you're free, we can have a word out there today. All right, thank you very much, guys. Thank you, Mr. Liu. You can take a seat. Thank you for sharing about DG products and services. Wonderful. Ladies and gentlemen, the session has now come to an end. On behalf of SOBA 2022 Organizing Committee, partners and sponsors, we would like to say thank you, all speakers, for sharing their knowledge with us. And also our participants for joining us in today's session. SOBA 2022, SOBA 2022, is brought to you by Star Media Group uh, with Credit Guarantee Corporate in Malaysia Berhad, CGC, DG, PKT Logistics, and RHB Bank Berhad as our main sponsors. Talon Corp Malaysia, Ministry of Trade as the official trade promotion partner supported by Brosa Malaysia and audited by BDO, as well as Surya and 988 as our official media partners. For those who for those of you who are on Facebook and YouTube, you thank you very much for joining us. Um, the live feed will remain continuing for us to talk about So by Help Does video. And for all the attendees, we are here at Manara, we're here at, I beg your pardon, for all the attendees who are here with us at Manara Star, PJ, please do visit our booth outside and feel free to approach any one of our staff to assist you more about SOBA 2022. If you have any questions on applying SOBA 20, 2022, we will be at the help desk to assist your inquiries. Before I sign off, ladies and gentlemen, Sumptuous Buffet Lunch is waiting for you at Cyber Hub, so don't just go away. Do go to the Cyber Hub later on after this. Once again, to learn more about SOBA 2022 online application process, you may scan the QR code as shown on the screen and visit us at www.soba.com.my. The submission is still open until 30th of November this year. Don't forget about that. Right, thank you so much for joining us. Have a pleasant day. I am Raymond Chia, signing off for SOBA 2022 PJ. Round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> for the panelists, I will invite you to stay for a bit for a photo group session. And members of the floor, visitors, you may adjourn to the cyber hub for your lunch. Lunch is waiting for you. <laughs>